Thank you, Anthony. And uh, I'm going to take this out of here real quick. If I can, maybe I should put my water down. Is this on? Yes, it is. Thank you. Um, so thank you, Anthony. And let me just reiterate, well, maybe expand on a little bit what Anthony uh, mentioned and just in thanking our host for hosting us tonight, uh, but to also thank our host for hosting us and so many uh, community organizations here at Montecito Union. This has become many different forms of community as I've witnessed at the Montecito Center have come out of this disaster and Montecito Union has always been here and been at a, a core um, uh, uh, source of community support and in this disaster just Anthony thank you so much for always having us here always saying yes and just being a your team is excellent and uh, and so are you so we appreciate you so much um, as Anthony <laughs> thank you as Anthony said my name is Ben Romo uh, I work for the County Office of Emergency Management uh, I helped open the Montecito Center uh, which I know a number of you have come to visit um, and we're meant to be a centralized location uh, for support and, uh, and services uh, for those who've been impacted by the disaster. And we started in March. Uh, we opened with a early March. We started with a plan to be open for about three to six months. Uh, and we've seen a lot of different issues and challenges uh, from residents who've been impacted by this. And we've done uh, everything we can to connect folks uh, with with the services and the support that they need to uh, to help them on their road to recovery. When folks come into the Montecito Center, we often encounter a, a long list of um, challenges that they're facing. And I'm looking out in the audience, and I'm just seeing people who I've gotten to know over the past few months, and. Um, and it's it reminds me of all of the individual stories and when we see that list and we're sitting down and talking to people um, and, and hearing what it is that they experienced and what they need um, there are a set of things on that list of challenges where the county of Santa Barbara has a, a, a very uh, official function and role to play and um, where we, uh, where, you know, in terms of permitting and our flood control department, uh, our flood control division, both of which have been uh, excellent partners and doing, doing excellent work to help the community. So there are, there are certain functions that the county government plays that are very clear. And then there, are, there, there, are, there is usually a set of issues and challenges on that list that residents bring us uh, that are not quite county related or maybe not at all county related. And what we try to do at the Montecito Center, and really the, the goal for the Montecito Center, has been to create a central location where we can pool resources beyond just what the county can bring and to bring in additional resources from nonprofit organizations, from organizations like Habitat for Humanity, Bucket Brigade, Brigade, um, our conservator who's been on site um, getting rid of mold, uh, our, our excellent team of emotional support uh, folks with the HOPE 805 program. These, are, these all represent the community's response and many, many more who I, uh, I'm not, I'm, I, I don't have time to mention. These represent the community response that I think we should all feel very proud of in terms of uh, this being a truly community-wide effort to support people in their recovery. And those folks have been excellent for us. And, um, and we've worked down that list as best we can to address the many diverse and m most often very complex challenges that people are facing in the recovery process. One of the most difficult challenges for us to help people with is on the topic of insurance. We at the county, we, we don't have authority. We don't have regulatory control over insurance companies. Um, and we're not experts in it. And, uh, and so we've, we've been very thankful and lucky to have great partners in our state legislators. Hannabeth Jackson, our state senator. Monique Limon, our state assembly members. We have two members of their staff who are here today and can share about their legislative efforts at the state level um, to try to address the challenges that they're hearing about. And I really encourage everyone to contact their offices with the challenges that you're facing because there is some, at least some, 
regulatory authority at the state level over insurance companies. We've had the insurance commissioner down. Um, there is a state insurance commissioner. He's been very supportive, had him down. He also sent a crew of his, of his staff members. I know a number of you visited the Montecito Center when we had a crew of his staff members down. They, we are asking them to come back down again. And so, um, so like I said, we at the county have been struggling because this is a very difficult, complex, um, set of issues around insurance companies and insurance coverage and we are hearing um, we hear the full spectrum I'm being served very very well by my provider to uh, things are a bit disastrous uh, in terms of the level of service that people are receiving and so this event we're so appreciative of United policyholders I'm going to introduce Amy Bach in just a moment who will take it away and, uh, and, and get us into the meat of the agenda for the evening. But I'm so appreciative of Amy and her team from United Policyholders organizing this event, sharing with their, their expertise. There's a, 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 a volunteer attorney here as well, Amy, Dennis, maybe if you could stand, Dennis, if you're in the room at this very moment, um, who is uh, available to provide some, some guidance to folks as well. Um, and, uh, and so, I, um, so I'm going to turn it over to, to Amy in just a, just a moment. Um, a couple of folks I do want to thank. Um, I mentioned um, our, uh, our representatives from Assemblymember Limon's office and uh, from State Senator uh, Hannabeth Jackson. I also want to thank um, Chris Henson from Congressmember Salud Carbajal's office, who's here with us today. And then we have Darcel Elliott, who's, uh, who's from uh, County Supervisor Doss Williams's office, uh, who has just been, uh, Darcel and Doss have been wonderful partners and leaders in, in all of this recovery, and we, we're very appreciative of that. So again, this is meant to be an opportunity for experts who have, um, well, expertise <laughs> um, on this very complex subject matter to come share and then for the community to also hear uh, and share your experiences um, and an opportunity for you to meet each other. Because this disaster and what came out of it and the challenges that people are facing in this area of insurance, it has implications in terms of state law. And, um, and we at the county, you know, we're, we, we, we deal with county legislation and county policies and we're not you know we're a government agency so we're not a community organizing entity it's really up to community residents like yourselves who share this common experience and this common um, interest to get together and to learn from each other and support each other and also make your stories and your experience experiences heard so that it can inform the work of our state legislators who are advocating for us in Sacramento and uh, and with as much as possible with, with the insurance companies themselves. So with that, uh, I don't think I forgot anything. I'm gonna check my little, my little notes here. Um, I think that's about it. And I, will, I, I wanna thank also Lisa Valencia Sherratt, who helped uh, organize this evening's event, working with United Policyholders um, and others. So thank you very much, Lisa. Lisa's on the center staff and has been helping coordinate uh, uh, a lot of the things that we're doing down there. So with that, uh, Amy Bach, Executive Director with United Policyholders. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ben. <clears throat> um, good evening, and thank you for finding the time to come to yet another evening event um, and I'm just very very pleased to see um, a good solid community group here um, tonight because I think um, you know we're here to bring um, whatever information that we can offer that's going to help solve your problems uh, but also to uh, just give you some perspective on um, as much pain as your community is in um, it is it is you're not the first community to have to go through something like this and um, I can assure you that there is 
an end um, down the road and um, you may not see it but um, I can assure you that it is there um, and the fact that you have um, sort of the best example of government doing um, what it what we needed to do uh, pulling resources together uh, and working together uh, is something that should all I think make us feel somewhat optimistic um, in a difficult time for for all of us so my name is Amy Bach um, this is Sandy Watts um, and we uh, travel down here from San Francisco where our nonprofit is um, based. And again, I want to thank Lisa for pulling this together um, with us and with Ben. Um, uh, pretty short notice, um, so uh, that makes it even more great that uh, you all heard about it. Um, and then, uh, you know, well, one, one back for one second. So um, actually, uh, Senator Hannah Beth Jackson um, is carrying a bill that is up in the assembly tomorrow uh, that is relevant to your situation uh, and and I had to be in touch with her office this morning saying oh my gosh I can't be there but I arranged to have one of our board members be there so there's a lot of people working um, to support your recovery so again I hope that gives you some measure of, of comfort um, you've got some really really strong elected officials um, you know get that are batting for you and again I don't how many of you know that there are these bills pending in Sacramento Sacramento that at one point were talked about being retroactive to help you there's you never know in the sausage factory what's going to come out it's I consider it kind of a long shot um, that these bills will legally end up being retroactively available to you but they still are giving you leverage in your negotiations so that's a little bit of a positive okay um, so we can yeah we can move on um, about United Policyholders, how many of you went to our Ventura workshops or the clinic? Okay. Um, we are a 501c3 nonprofit, which means we're, uh, we're declared to be tax exempt because we, our charter is to educate um, and advocate for consumers. So we're not a law firm, we're not a public adjusting firm, we're not a construction firm. We're your basic charity, like the Red Cross or Habitat for Humanity. Um, our mission is to educate and inform insurance consumers and advocate for fairness in insurance practices. That is our mission. Uh, that was what um, I co-founded the organization in 1992. We incorporated right after the Oakland Berkeley firestorm, which had been a record breaker, but now last fall's uh, fires knocked them out of their spot. Um, and certainly the Thomas fire knocked a lot of stats out of their spot, um, as well as the debris flow. Um, we are uh, we do work around the country but we're we are small we have a very small staff um, that's why um, you know if somebody was going to go up there tomorrow it was probably going to be me um, but uh, but that's not to say that we don't have the power um, of we of a, of a very large network which we do we have um, hundreds of, of volunteers around the country that are attorneys I asked Dennis Neil Jones to be here today because he practices in Ventura he has written um, he's been a volunteer for us writing a friend of the court briefs um, in cases related to uh, this legal concept how, how many of you heard of this t concept of proximate cause yeah, okay. So this stuff is gnarly, you know, this causation and the fine print and insurance contracts and, and the legalities. And Dennis is one of those people that knows dirt and he knows, um, he, he argues for policyholders to get coverage. So I asked him to come, um, but he's just one of hundreds of volunteers we have around the country that make their living representing policyholders. And then we have hundreds of people that are volunteers that lost homes in wildfires. That is kind of, in a way, the back backbone of our organization. So for 20 years, we've been going into the communities where there have been wildfires, giving people an education about how the insurance claim process is supposed to work, how you can represent yourself to get every dollar you're entitled to, and then when you, if you hit a wall, where can you go for help? from there and then working in Sacramento and other states and even sometimes in DC um, to put whatever leverage, bring whatever leverage we can to help you guys get 
uh, from point A to point B and back as close as possible to where you were um, before the loss. Now, um, we know a lot about insurance. Uh, we don't sell it. We don't take money from insurance companies. And we can't be your individual lawyers. We can't be your public adjusters. We know lots of people who do that work. Some of them support us. Some of them don't. Um, and we take a lot of their expertise and the expertise of disaster survivors who say, oh, God, I learned this the hard way. I hope somebody else can take this information and not have to learn it the hard way and use it and come out a little easier maybe than I did. So that is kind of, that's the core of what United Policy Soldiers offers is that, that very, uh, very uh, technical expertise and also um, a, a little bit of kind of, you know, encouragement and like, you can do this. Um, and if you can't, there's help. All right. Um, we're funded by donations and grants. We got a small grant from something called the Center for Disaster Philanthropy that allowed us to come down. Um, we have funding in Sonoma and Napa right now. Um, and so that's where we, and of course we're based in San Francisco, so it's been very easy for us um, to do a lot of work up there. A lot of the people in those communities um, have a lot in common with, with this community. How many of you think you don't have enough coverage A to put your house back the way it was? Coverage A, dwelling, insurance coverage on your dwelling, to put it back, how many? Okay, so um, that's where you have a lot in common with the people up in the, uh, up in the North Bay. Obviously, you have some very different circumstances here that make it even more painful in, in some ways. Um, but again, the challenges that your community is experiencing um, are, are uh, m many of them uh, are challenges that, that uh, we have information that can help with. Okay, um, this workshop is intended to be general guidance only, not legal advice. Um, we don't endorse or warrant any of the sponsors listed um, on our website or the speakers, our speakers volunteer their time as educators. Um, this is a shot of our website. We have uh, a library dedicated for your, um, the Thomas Fire and Debris Flow Insurance Claim Help Library. Um, this is the URL, uphelp.org backslash Thomas Fire, one word. You're going to find on there links to all kinds of publications. We have samples of reports. This is what an Xactimate report looks like. This is what a code upgrade report looks like. This is what an industrial hygienist report looks like, that kind of thing. Um, and then uh, you will find um, uh, sample letters letters for writing to your insurance company um, and and flexing your muscle as a consumer, letters for enforcing your rights, uh, getting copies of your claim file, that kind of thing. And we do have a professional help directory um, where you'll find some lawyers that support us. Um, and all the lawyers that are in our directory are what I consider policyholder lawyers, meaning in peacetime, in between disasters, that they are still representing people who have insurance with problems related to insurance. That's what they do. They're on the policyholder side. Um, you, we don't have any defense lawyers who work for insurance companies giving support to us. Um, that's just the way things go with us. So when I say you can hire professional help in our library, that just means those are just some lawyers that support us. I don't endorse them. I'm just saying it is a place to go to find lawyers that have the niche specialty. Okay. Um, we also have... Um, um, uh, a, a very, very extensive uh, Excel home inventory spreadsheet. It's free. It's got thousands and thousands of items. It was donated to us by a San Diego wildfire survivor who happened to be very meticulous and listed every single thing that she could, uh, you know, she spent over, I think, two years working on her inventory. She donated it to us. We had a couple of volunteers comb through and see if there was anything they wanted to add. So that's there for you free um, on our website, uphelp.org. Okay, next. Um, <clears throat> we didn't have enough. We didn't know how many people were going to be here. Um, so I brought down as many um, of these yellow books as I could fit in my suitcase. Um, but we're going to send um, another box to Lisa and Ben. So if you want to get one, you'll be able to pick one up at their center. Um, this is a book that we wrote um, 
It's a combination of um, a disaster recovery handbook with, with all kinds of guidance on um, navigating the road to recovery, plus um, at the in the back, if you're not an internet person um, and uh, you're not a spreadsheet Excel type person, um, and by the way, your insurance company should accept your inventory um, as long as it's legible and it is um, and it and it is clear. Uh, they are should not be requiring you to put your inventory in on a specific form. So you could use in the back of this book we have chapters that list common items in, in a household um, and you could even use something like that um, to, to, to help you with your list. Okay, um, Sandy, do you want to just quickly talk about the Ask an Expert forum? Hi. Um, so we have an expert, Ask an Expert forum, excuse me, online. Um, you can just go in and you can type in. We're kind of in the process. We had it a little bit closed down for a while because we were getting so many um, questions from the Sonoma, the North Bay fires. But you can go in there and you can ask a question and then we go to our bank of experts of people and we try to help answer your question. So you can register, it's free, you write in your question and we send it to the thing. Everything stays private. We try to, we can't answer everybody's questions because sometimes it's really specific. Um, and we, what we do is we publish the answers to the questions that we feel would be kind of the common good to everyone. And so one of the things that comes out of this is if you go onto our website and you go to the search, there's a little search like everybody has, and you type in your issue like additional living expense or earth movement or whatever, you can pull up not only our articles, but you can pull up questions that other people have asked on the same, the same question. So it's a really good resource. Thanks. Um, and I just ask before you use that, um, try poking around on the website. You know, we have been building our library for decades, so there's really, um, you know, you're going to find a lot of information. Now, that's not to say you want to get into the weeds on everything. Maybe you don't. Um, but if you did want to, um, it's here. Okay, so we also, um, so like I said, we have we have our the libraries, um, links to government and professional help, um, and then all kinds of, of FAQs, frequently asked questions about, let's say, uh, how many of you are thinking about had a, a rebuild, I'm sorry, skipping the rebuild and just buying a replacement house, but want to collect all your insurance benefits to buy that? Is there anybody here in that situation? Okay. So, for example, on that one, we have FAQs because there's the, the law that allows you to take your full replacement benefits, including your code upgrade benefits and your extended benefits, and instead of using them to rebuild, you can use them to buy, is a relatively new law. I mean, relative. It's probably, I don't know probably like eight years old at this point, but it wasn't around um, after a lot of the past disasters and a lot of the adjusters who've come into California um, and to adjust your claims um, and all the other claims that hit in the fall, including all the hurricanes, a lot of them didn't are not familiar with California laws. Um, and so we have a lot of protections in this state. Now, um, uh, we can move to the next one. Dave Jones, the insurance commissioner, um, is, is a great guy. Um, um, and I know he was down here, uh, and I know they did the one-on-one, -on -one, um, and we actually asked them to be here uh, with us today, but they have their team um, is going to be in Sacramento on the bills, and so I know they will come back, and we will we will work on that um, to make sure that happens. Um, but their, um, their abilities, they have a limit... Too. Just like we can't be your free lawyers, um, they can't be your free lawyers either. So as much as they can sit down with you, um, there's a limit to how much they can help you. Um, but that is not to say that they don't need to hear from you. They need to hear from you. That department, that agency is in charge of overseeing the insurance marketplace in the state, as you heard from Ben Romo, right? And you know this. Um, but again, you have probably now also know that unlike the commercials that you've seen that portray your insurance company as your good neighbor or flow and you know they've got magic wands and they appear in your living room and they can make time go back and then you know it's the reality is 
that an insurance policy is this card hard cold legal contract written by teams of lawyers that if every single time a legal decision comes down that they lose they go back and try to tighten up that language so they don't have to pay out the next time not not on everything obviously but this stuff is complicated and I know you must know that by now because you're sitting here on a beautiful summer evening um, inside um, listening to me talk right so again my my job is to try to help you get every dime out of your insurance and to have a realistic um, plan going forward. Um, that's why we're here, okay? We're not here, we don't have a magic wand either, and I, I wish I, that I did. Um, but, I, but I do know that there's a lot more wiggle room in your insurance negotiations than you would ever think, okay? And that is, I, you know, in terms of like the good news that I can bring you, it is that you can negotiate more than you think you can, um, but you can't do it uh, without backup. You have to have backup, and we're going to be talking about that documentation of what your losses were. Um, okay, so we have a survey that we're doing. We want to, we're doing it with the center, um, and it's really, um, I don't know if you're sick of taking surveys, whatever, get over it, please take this one, because um, we use this information to help you, okay? We just did our six-month survey in Sonoma and Napa. We got really useful information. 66% of the people were underinsured. Well, the media loved, wanted it to cover that, right? That puts coverage like that puts pressure on the insurance companies, right? They don't want to be out there getting a bad reputation in the newspapers um, more than necessary, right? So when you give us information, when you, you answer a survey, that makes it possible for our organization to be an even more powerful advocate for um, a good outcome for all of you, right? Because we can share that information where your name can stay confidential, but we share that information with some of your elected officials and with the Department of Insurance and with the media, okay? To say, this is how insurance is working in this community or not working. This is where the insurance companies need to step up, okay? And you've had some good luck here with waivers. How many of you have had your, your inventory uh, require, itemization waived? Uh, okay, no, no, okay. Yeah, I would have been happy to see more um, than that. But again, the contract doesn't require them to, I'm sorry? Meaning that the insurance company said, you don't have to itemize every single thing you had. We're just going to pay you your contents benefits. Or we're going to pay you 70% or 80% or 100% of your benefits um, without you having to go through this listing. Right. So, so okay, this is a political dance, to be really honest with you, all right? The letter of the law, the way the contract works is you got to prove your losses, even though we go, you know, we're up there in Sacramento saying, well, wait a second, you charged, let's say you charged $500 for, for the contents portion of this policy, and you sold this person $200,000 worth of contents coverage. Now, every single thing they owned is gone. Why aren't you just cutting them a check for $200,000? That's the arguments that, that have been going on in Sacramento. And the insurance companies say, well, that's just not how it works, okay? But because of the political pressure that Dave Jones put on the carriers, and because of the community organizing that's been going on, a lot of the insurers this fall were changing the rules and saying, you know what, we're not going to make you itemize. But not all of them are doing it, obviously, right? And some of them are saying, we're going to pay you all your contents. And some are saying, we'll pay you 80% without an itemized list. And if you want that other 20, you're going to have to itemize it all. Again, no matter where you are in with your insurance company, and again, there is no one-size-fits-all path, all right? There are ways to get through this, right? If your insurance company is insisting that you itemize everything, well then use our spreadsheet, right? Or use your friends. And I know it sounds like, oh yeah, she, may, she sounds like, oh yeah, that's, like it's easy. I know it's not easy. I mean, I've been doing this work for a long time and I know that doing a personal property inventory is one of the most 
uh, painful parts of recovering from a loss. It's it's really I'm convinced that you know you're you have a you know heart and mind right, and I think you know the 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 heart is trying to heal and 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 from the pain of the loss and and doesn't really want your mind to remember the things that you. That's why you know you hear a lot of the time when people have had a um, gone through a disaster, you're spacey, you're not you're just not yourself, you're just not you don't think clearly, you know, and I think that's in a way it's almost nature's design to try to like numb you a little bit um, but but again that's why our organization has developed a lot of tools to help you not have to remember everything but to look at our spreadsheet and say oh yeah okay I had this I didn't have that um, we're going to get to Q&A I promise but if this you want to add yeah Right. Right. I get it completely. Well, okay, so if you might find at this stage, um, uh, we say, yeah, I get it. I really, really, really get it. Um, but what can you do but try to move forward, right? What There isn't any other way to go if you want to, to, to do that, right? You have to just say, okay, I'm gonna, and we're gonna, let's get into some more of the meat of our, of our suggestions. All right, wait, wait, sorry, go back one second. Um, okay, so when I say take your time, you do have two years, right, of a minimum of your ALE, and I know a lot of you are thinking that's not enough, there's no way I'm gonna be rebuilt, and we're gonna have to cross that bridge and push for the insurers to extend those limits, um, because it's not through your fault that you can't get back in your home. Um, but, but as far, and you have two years to collect your replacement value coverage, right? So when we say take your time, what we mean is don't let an adjuster pressure you, right? Because um, that's, th that's not th th their right. Um, it's you have, we say this a lot, a disaster recovery is a marathon, not a sprint. So you have to take your time um, because when you don't, um, you make it harder. Okay, treat your insurance claim like a business negotiation, right? One of the most important tools you have is your legal leverage in the state of California where every single remedy that could possibly be available to you under the law practically is available to you in California. I work all over the country and there are states like Arkansas Arkansas, where you are dead in the water if you want to take an insurance company on. And in this state, it's the opposite, right? You, The law is on your side in this state, okay? So unfortunately, that's just another challenge for you is, okay, how do I flex my legal rights? We're going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, but when we say um, treat it like a business negotiation, we're talking about paper trail. All right, next. Um, uh, keeping, it's never too late to start. I know we're six, seven months down the road here. Um, keeping a claim diary, taking notes on who you talk to, um, presenting your, right, your request clearly and in writing, explaining what you need, when you need it, why you're entitled to it. Now, you know, we, I, I know when you get to this stage and you may have the feelings that were just expressed of like, this is ridiculous, I can't believe this is not right, I'm mad. Um, it's very tempting to write really long letters um, to your insurance company and I really recommend against that because insurance adjusters, um, Sandy will tell you, are human beings um, and they have natural feelings of like they can dig in their heels and they can say, you know what, this person is nuts or this person is is just trolling for a fight and I'm just going to ignore. Now, that's they're not supposed to do that they're not really allowed to do that but it is human nature so one of the things we're here to tell you is is to, you know try to like how do you navigate this thing right because it's just it's not the way it should be I'm not here to tell you oh you know this is this is exactly the way it should be it's not but this is how it is and so we're here to give you suggestions for navigating okay um, how many of you feel like you have a complete copy of your policy okay um, you want to talk about that? 
Yeah. yeah. So, so, do you, how many of you have a certified copy of your policy? Okay. And how many people have been refused by their insurer when they've asked for one? Has anybody asked for one? Yeah. So, yeah, that's one of the bills that's going through, hopefully tomorrow, that they're going to be required to provide them. We can't reiterate enough how important it is to request a certified copy of your policy. And when you're working your claims, you should be going off of that policy. I got somebody asking me a question the other day. I said, oh, send me a copy of, of your policy. The loss happened in 2017. The policy their agent gave them was from 2004. <laughs> so the first thing I did was like, I mean, the numbers don't even match up on the denial letter. So, so a certified copy of the policy is where an under, the underwriting department, not the, the claims person has to request it from the actual company, um, from the underwriting department where a um, underwriter pulls your file pulls all of the endorsements, okay? So you have, you have your main policy, and then each policy has different endorsements, and everybody's endorsements are different based on what your agent sold you, what you asked for, and what you need to insure. So you have all these endorsements, it's brought up and it's verified by an officer of the company. So it has to have a signature. So you know when it has a signature on the front, um, signed by an officer of the company that that's a certified policy. Um, the, it should have a stamp, but if you've got a signature, a real human signature, not a, not a stamp, not a stamp signature. Sometimes they have like a company stamp they put on it. Um, but for instance, in the um, North Bay fires, there was a company that was just sending, you know, PDFs via email. And when people started getting certified copies, they found an endorsement that says, hey, if you're a, a declared disaster, your coverage is increased un un under these circumstances. It increased their coverage dramatically. And so each one of those endorsements is really important, really important. And so they should be, a lot of companies are pushing back, but they should really be providing that to you so that you can look at each at each thing and along those lines when they do send you letters they should be specifically specifically stating each thing they shouldn't just be you know regurgitating huge blocks of language they should they should be pulling out the specific parts that apply to your claim so um, we did get a law through uh, after uh, one of the rounds of the San Diego fires that does require your insurer to give you, as if, you, I just, why you would need a law, but anyway, we did, there is a law that says the insurance company has to give you a complete copy of your policy within 30 days after your written request, okay? So you do have that law, that right, right now, right? And why are we talking about this now, so many months down the road? Because these days, um, and a lot of insurers have been rushing to go paperless, and you know, half the time your agent or your broker doesn't even have the copy of your policy. But it is always worth making sure you get that certified copy now, or even in three months from now. Because like Sandy said, you may find, for example, if you're with Safeco, you may find that they they're have an endorsement that in the event of a declared disaster, doubles your code upgrade coverage and your extended replacement. But again, you wouldn't know that unless you got the certified copy of the policy, right? Okay, um, <clears throat> may, can you show me where it says that in my policy should be one of your common refrains to your insurance adjuster? How many of you have had more than four different adjusters rotate through at this point? Okay, so again, we got a law through um, saying that by law, if you have three or more adjusters assigned to your claim within a six month period, they must give you a status report, right? I know a lot of the time the insurers are not complying with this, but again, if you write to them and you say, uh, I want a status report as I'm entitled to under California law um, because of the fact that, that more than three adjusters have rotated through, um, if you put that in writing to them and they don't give it to you, technically they have violated the law. And again, you're not trying to play gotcha here, but you are building your case to say, okay, you need to do what I'm asking you to do, and here's why, right? So you're building your your best arguments, right? You're going to be, um, and we were talking, uh, again, I, um, Sandy, I, 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 I short 
changed her on the intros. But Sandy has two decades of um, experience adjusting claims. So, um, you know, we brought her on um, and uh, for that expertise, which um, has been fantastic. Um, I'm, I'm a, a lawyer. I actually was a, what, I was a bad faith lawyer. I used to sue insurance companies for a living, um, but I have been an advocate now for uh, full time for a long time. But I still know that the bad faith law is 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 one of your most potent sources of leverage to get um, out on the other side of this thing, okay? Um, and why we go on and on about the paper trail and how your letters should be concise and your letters should be not as, as try to keep the emotion out as much as you possibly can. Write the emotional letter and then put it somewhere and then write the really bullet point like you know, uh, uh, this happened, this happened, I need this, I need, and why, all right? Um, vent to somebody else if you can. If you can't, I, it's understandable. All right. Um, politely remind you, them about your situation. Give them a specific time frame. Why do we make such a big deal about this letter stuff? Because because that is, again, if that's where your leverage is coming from. They're going to look back at your claim, a supervisor, if it gets to where um, you've been the squeaky wheel long enough, somebody higher up in the company is going to look at it and they're going to look back at the file and they're going to say, huh, okay, oh boy, we didn't do this right or we didn't do that right and it's pretty clear from this paper trail that we, the insurance company, made some mistakes here. We better, we better fix this, right? So that's kind of what we're trying to help you do so that you have um, always documented your cooperation and you've always given them a chance to do the right thing. You haven't been a pushover, but you've given them a chance to do the right thing. Okay, um, next. Uh, uh, what are the best practices when negotiating? Um, keep it professional, be concise and specific. Like I said, bold or bullet point your requests, avoid long paragraphs, use good grammar and punctuation. So again, so they know you're a force to be reckoned with. Um, promptly respond to reasonable requests. Always put the ball back in their court. If they say, we got your contractor's estimate and we don't like this, this and that, okay, say, let's set up a time so we can sit down um, and let's, you bring in your contractor, right? So always put it back on their courts, in their court, so they don't, they're not saying, well, you know, we tried to help this person, but hey, they didn't answer us for months on end. And again, I get it. Like, you can't, you're not machines. You have lives. And this is now another sort of a full-time job. But again, just always keep your nice, try to keep your paper trail clean and clear so that if somebody looked back on it, they would see the chronology of what happened and they would say, this homeowner did as much as they could right. They cooperated with the requests that the insurance company made. They made themselves available. They gave the insurance company the information. When they couldn't, they explained why. Okay? Um, next. Um, your personal leverage, obviously, is very powerful. Um, the sudden tragedy has turned your life upside down. You're doing your best with the many details. If you have special circumstances, you want to write that in a letter, um, probably more than one time to remind them um, what your special circumstances are. Maybe you're a senior citizen. Maybe you're a commuting worker. Maybe you're disabled. Maybe you're a small business owner. Again, if these are reasons why you are asking for their help on something that they should give it to you. Again, you're portraying yourself as the good guy that's doing everything right. Um, okay. Um, records are all gone and painstaking to recreate. Okay. What's your legal and political leverage? The fair claims regulations. Um, in the California Code of Regulations that say have all these timelines like when you write to an insurance company um, they're supposed to write back within 15 days when you make a request for the payment of benefits they're supposed to pay or deny within 40 days or tell you why they're not okay um, you'll find uh, CCR 2695 and then there's a whole sequence of them absolutely they should not just one of the things I keep seeing are these letters saying, we are unable to make a decision on your claim um, because we need more time. That's not actually good enough. They actually have to say specifically what they're working on in order, like say for instance, they sent you the 
their estimate. You sent in your contractor's estimate sort of as a rebuttal. And they keep, I, I've seen a lot of them where they just keep sending them the 30-day letters and sending them the 30-day. We can't, fin the, you deserve more than just we're working on your claim. Um, and they need to, and you need to sort of, um, I think a good idea if you can do it, even if it's a one-liner, write back and say specifically, what are you working on? How can I help you with that? What can I do to get that through to you? Because a lot of them think that if they send that 30-day letter, then they're just, you know, they can buy all the time they want, and it's it's just a stalling tactic. So um, hold their feet to the fire on that and have them tell you exactly what it is that they're doing and say, you know, what do you need to make this decision? Because they, a lot of them sit with both estimates for a really long time and don't do anything. And then, you know, time is time is flying and your ALE is running out. So that's, that's my Okay. And then, um, so uh, all of this stuff is pretty easy to find on our website. We have um, in the li library that we set up for you guys, for the Thomas Fire, w there's a short menu of four sections, um, one on overcoming obstacles, one on your dwelling, one contents. And in there, we have a publication, Your Legal Rights in California. And we go through um, the, 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 the specifics that are generally relevant to people. Um, then you also have rights under the insurance code, um, the Unfair Insurance Practices Act, which talks about how the insurance company is not allowed to put their financial interests on ahead of yours. And they have an obligation um, to give you the information that you need to get your claim paid um, and all that kind of thing. They have that duty of good faith and fair dealing. I'm sure you've been hearing about this at other seminars, things like that. But all it means, what is bad faith? It means unreasonable conduct. So it's it's not like there's this little laundry list of, you know, you stepped on my toe, that's bad faith. It's more that... Um, was the insurance company behaving unreasonably, right? And given that the insurance policy is a contract, um, they're always going to make the argument that as long as they are following the letter of the contract, they're not being unreasonable. The trick for you guys is that they have to interpret that policy fairly. They cannot just read it in their own favor. They have to read it in a fairly balanced way. And if the wording is ambiguous or it makes to you, it looks like, for example, well, it looks like my extended replacement coverage does apply to my code upgrade benefits as well. If, it, if, the, if the, the way the policy is worded if a reasonable person could read it that way, then you win, okay? That's the law in California. Um, okay, they have to pay undisputed amounts promptly, um, and even if after you've sued them, they still have a duty to <laughs> treat you um, with, with a good faith. Um, and then, what is your political leverage? Um, well, you saw it a little bit with the insurance commissioner. You saw it a little bit with the way the carriers agreed to pay for the debris flow. Um, which we didn't know that that was going to happen. So that, a lot of that is a result of political leverage, okay? Um, and, and, all right, what are the common challenges under insurance? We talked about that. Um, the earth movement slash flood exclusion. Um, uh, lost valuation disputes. The insurance company says we can put this house back for... 200,000, your contractor said is 600,000. That's very common. Maybe not those numbers, but that's common. Um, adjusters who are unfamiliar with California laws on RCV, replacement cost value, meaning not the old used price, but the price to replace the object. Um, depreciation, big source of disputes where adjusters can be all over the map on how they depreciate your stuff. Um, and we have all kinds of publications on that. Um, and if we, when we get to Q&A, happy to answer some of them. Uh, delays and conflicting information, rotating adjusters, we talked about that. Those are the most common challenges. And again, um, we offer uh, strategies for all those things. Um, and then which path to take to try to resolve these disputes? Um, so we have made a little, a little grid here. I don't know if you can see it um, on the back. If you didn't get a handout, you can raise your hand and we'll grab them and um, thanks. Okay, so type of issue, which path to take to settle a dispute? Okay, 
We've got type of issue, path one, negotiation. Path two, filing a complaint with the California Department. Path, path three, mediation. Path four, appraisal. Path five, legal help. Legal help includes joining one of the lawsuits against a utility, um, if that is a, a, a path that you are looking to, to um, to be made whole for your losses. Okay, so let's say the issue is coverage limits. You're underinsured. Um, you can try negotiating that. There's lots of stories. People talk about getting paid over limits in confidential um, uh, negotiations that they can't talk to you about. Um, I'm going to always call that one at 50-50. Um, the law is tough on getting an insurance company to pay more than what they owe in the contract, but it definitely has been done under certain circumstances. If you have the right circumstances where you can show that you were innocently underinsured through no fault of your own, you didn't reject any kind of recommendation to increase your coverage or you know the agent came out and saw your place and should have known better that that was never going to be enough to put it back, that kind of thing. Um, so of course you always want to try to negotiate, you always should file a complaint with the Department of Insurance um, because, again, if they don't know about these problems, they cannot help solve them. Um, mediation is not usually that valuable to resolve an under-insurance dispute because the insurance companies know they have the law on their side generally, so they're just they're not going to want to voluntarily pay, again, unless you've given them some very compelling reason why they owe more than what's in the contract. Okay? Um, same thing with appraisal not really useful. Legal help, yes. Okay. Um, in our family of volunteers, there is a handful of policyholder lawyers who have represented underinsured disaster survivors um, and proved that the insurance company was systematically uh, underestimating replacement values at the point of sale. So it's been done, it can be done, and it will be done again, um, but it's very hard to do it without a very, very competent policyholder lawyer who really knows the landscape. That And also, it's got to be a lawyer that insurance companies um, are afraid of, to be honest with you. <laughs> I don't, or and I don't mean afraid of. They're not afraid. I mean, respect. Thank you. Respect. Respect. Okay? Um, a lot of times, you know, lawyers come flooding into the community. Oh, yes, we can help you. And, you know, you don't want to hire your brother-in-law, the real estate lawyer, or your, you know, sister, the tax lawyer, to try to take on an under-insurance case against an insurance company, that's just a waste, okay? It's really um, one of these these areas where you need an expert. Yeah. Yeah, well, in our, in our um, first of all, we have a whole underinsurance help section in our library, and we actually have articles written by some of the lawyers that have have uh, successfully represented people in under insurance cases. And they're in our fine help directory as well in the state of California. Um, okay, if your issue is payments owed, how much and when, um, and by the way, there's already a suit pending for uh, against USAA on behalf of a bunch of the North, uh, North Bay Fire people um, for, for systematically lowballing on replacement limits and for, and there's actually one I think also against farmers, and I'm sure there have been lawyers around here soliciting you, I'm guessing. No? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> anyway, um, okay, uh, payments owed, how much and when, negotiate, all those ways can resolve um, a payment dispute, negotiation, complaining, mediating, appraisal, legal help. Um, replacing by buying, not rebuilding, that's really a negotiation um, a piece. Um, evaluation dispute, again, all those options can settle that. Um, the waiver, you can use our survey results. So our survey results from the North Bay show, um, all kinds of relaxation of rules, insurers relaxing the rules. You can go in and to our survey results and you can write to your insurance company and say, hey, I see that, that you waive these rules, you relax these rules for people in Sonoma. I want you to do the same for me because otherwise that's not fair. So you can look at our survey results on our website and see where insurers have bent the rules and then use that uh, in your to, to argue for what you're looking for. Um, 
Okay, conflicting and uh, inconsistent positions by adjusters. So, um, how, how, how many of you found out about tonight through Facebook? Okay. Um, how many of you guys found out about it through an email from our organization? A couple, okay. How many of you found out about tonight through the Center um, for Preparedness? Excellent work, Center for Preparedness, Recovery, and Rebuilding. Um, getting information to people in your situation is very hard. It's always hard. Um, people are spread all over. So you're very lucky to have a community-based center here. Very unusual and very fortunate. Um, but again, the reason I'm asking is in Sonoma, people have are organizing themselves um, into insurance groups. So there's a USA group, a state farm group, and they have listservs and they're chatting. The thing that's useful about that, and I'm sorry to say that um, United Policyholders doesn't have the people power to facilitate that ourselves. We have a whole template for how to do it, um, but you kind of have to do it yourselves. The, the good thing about chatting with other people that are insured with your same company is that they may have gotten a success where you've failed, and then you can use their success to help you. Um, but it, it, it's a double-edged, you know, sometimes talking to other people in your situation can be helpful, sometimes it can be um, depressing and discouraging, so I just encourage you to, you know, protect yourself. If you're talking to somebody else who's insured with your same insurance company, and, and they're bragging and making you feel bad, don't talk to them. But if they have good suggestions, then write them down okay um, because again it's not a competition um, but it is definitely not nearly as scientific as you'd think like it's a, a lot more um, all over the place right um, okay we talked already about the paper trail um, go up the chain. Um, Sandy um, was with a major insurance company for a number of years, two of them. Um, Sandy, you, can you give some tips on, you know, you know, a lot of people feel like, oh my God, I'm just, I, you know, I'm talking to this adjuster and I just, I, sometimes I feel like I'm talking to a wall or I don't, they just don't seem like um, they even have the power to give me what I need. How do you get over your adjuster's head? How many of you guys feel like you're being ignored by your adjuster? Or you got a few? Okay. So, you know, it's uh, adjusters are people, so you get good ones and you get bad ones. And um, so if you're if you're dissatisfied with their responsiveness, and we're not taking like the content of their answer as much as like if they're not getting back to you in a timely manner, if they're not answering your questions and, and doing things like that, you should really try to you know maybe talk to their supervisor find a way to kind of get past them one of the things that um every adjuster knows is that there's certain adjusters in groups that just don't answer their phones you know they just don't answer their phones they let it go to voicemail every single time they get back to people when they get back to people the fact of the matter is every other adjuster in that office knows who those people are and um, ends up picking up slack for them because if you call one of the big adjust, you know, State Farm, Allstate, all this, and if you hit zero, it's going to go to another adjuster. And what happens is once the other adjusters start getting calls about Sally, who's not answering her phone ever, they go and they complain to the supervisor and say, I can't get my work done because we're all answering Sally's questions and she's not answering them herself. So I think that's a really important thing to do. And just to just to insist, you know, so call, leave a message, write down when you left your message. If you don't get a call within 24 hours, call back, do it again, hit zero, try to get somebody else. And, you know, if you don't, you're, you're entitled to a reasonable response. And so if you get somebody else, you should ask to talk to a supervisor. I'm sorry. We'll, and we'll do a Q&A at the end, the end, but if you have something quick. You know, I think 24 hours. I think 24 hours, I mean, if it's Friday afternoon, I would give them, you know, maybe till Monday night, Tuesday morning, you know, something like that. 24 hours, most of the people should be able to do it then, you know. Um, well, the emails are tough, you know, because technically they have 15 days to respond to reasonable requests. Um, so, you know, that's a tough one. I think that... <laughs> I think three days is reasonable, but, you know, 
I don't think, you know, two hours is. I, I definitely think that if you don't get a call the next business day or a response to your email the next business day that you should follow up. And just sort of train them a little bit that you expect something in that, in that time. No. Yeah. They're, they're cons a fiduciary, for those of you who might just be burning to know, is a, um, it's a, it's a legal term to say, uh, to describe somebody who has a financial, um, sort of almost like a trusteeship to you, like they, they have to look out for your financial obligations. So insurance companies are considered quasi-fiduciaries meaning um, they, there is that legal principle I talked about earlier that they're not supposed to put their financial interests above yours, um, but that doesn't mean they have to look out for your financial interests as a fiduciary would, as let's say, um, and, 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 the, and the reason, that's relevant on the underinsurance issue because if they were fiduciaries and they underinsured people the way they do, um, it would be a lot easier to win in court. So it's possible that that law is going to change. We're working on that. Amy, I, um, I know, I know sure. you have a few more slides. Yeah. I just want to get to the end. Um, before we take questions, because uh, we want we want to use the mic for questions because we're filming Perfect. this and we're going to post it on YouTube. Gotcha. So if we could, if we could All right. hold the questions till the end. We'll great. blast through. All right. Um, if possible, uh, meet in person with your adjuster and a reputable builder. Um, that. Okay, all right. Um, you're, it, you know, there's nothing like making them actually sit down with you and, the, and somebody who knows about construction and say, okay, what is it about this estimate you don't like? Show me what you think is too high or missing or not whatever is, shouldn't be in there, okay? Um, and you know, one of the one of the challenges, uh, of course, is um, you know insurance companies these days. How many of you had an uh, adjuster offer to settle on the basis of something called an exactimate estimate, like a fancy looking, like inch thick? Right. Okay. Exactimate is a computerized esti construction estimating program. Um, it, it's something that the insurance industry kind of developed, trying to get consistency, I guess. Um, but um, if that's a nice way of putting it. But um, the real life builders generally didn't use it. Don't use it. You know, most of the time you have apples and oranges when you're trying to compare the documentation that the insurance company has provided about how much the repairs or the rebuild should costs versus the guy or gal that you have hired that is actually going to nail the nails, right? Uh, very often, they look completely different. You know, the, the estimate that your builder gives you, maybe, you know, five pages if you're lucky. Um, the estimate from the insurance company looks a lot more detailed. It's like, wow, it's so, it's so detailed. Um, but that's just a program. That doesn't mean that a living, breathing construction professional would do the job for the amount of money in that nice fancy thick right so just because it looks good doesn't mean it's going to trump your guy's work okay the challenge is getting your guy and the machine uh, estimates into apples to apples so you can see okay all right they don't look the same but how much is the is the is the uh, drywall going to cost? How much is the carpeting going to? And then you can start to kind of, you can you, what you need is the quantities. We're going to talk um, 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 about scope. When I look at you and you look like I'm confusing you, that's not good. Um, how many of you have heard um, a phrase "scope of loss"? Anybody? Scope of loss. Okay. Um, this is to say that the uh, that it it, des it describes the home, the repairs, or the rebuild, right? How many square feet of flooring? How big was it? What, what kind of countertops? What kind of flooring? Quantities, not price, quantities. So if you can get an agreement on scope, then you are halfway there to getting an agreement. Um, Sandy, do you want to talk about... Um, uh, this, how you can use an exactimate estimate as the basis for the scope? Everyone should ask their adjuster if they will provide them with a the scope, which is that exactimate estimate with no prices 
no prices attached. So you just get, so where, where it goes, it goes room by room. So you have living room. Hopefully it's nice and orderly. Like either they start at the ceiling and work down or start at the floor and work up. And you, go, you have to go through in painful detail. I had, you know, one inch red oak strip flooring. I had two inch baseboards. I had this type of texture on my walls. I had these, the, and you have to go through and really rip it apart part if you have pictures or you know just think and and really get that go back to them and say well you have this wrong I had this t I had tile in this room I didn't have carpet and get that completely correct and then you can start take a you can take that to your contractor and say okay this is what I have and it can kind of give them an, an idea of what to bid for and then you can get the prices and then you can kind of go back and just see the, um, when, when they give you the finalized scope and they put the prices on it for the estimate in the back there's a trade summary so that's what she was talking about so there'll be a trade summary for like foundation drywall rough framing finished carpentry, roofing, all of those ideas. And those you can use to compare with your contractor's estimates. And then hopefully you'll be able to identify just some general areas where there's differences and just focus on those areas. So that is really helpful. But nobody can give a good price if that scope isn't correct. And the challenge for homeowners is foundations, framing, you know, the things like that. So some of that you're going to have to rely on contractors maybe to help you with that. But if they have the dimensions of your rooms correct, I don't know how many of you have um, floor plans and stuff, but if they have the dimensions, the way that program works is if you have a room that's X amount and they frame it, the, the program will calculate how many two by four, 16 inch on center, you know, they'll figure that out. So it's going to be generally right um, if they have that right. But once you get that scope right, then you can start talking money. But there's no sense talking any money until that is exactly what you, your house used to look like. So you have to also remember that you have to do it the way it looked on the date of loss and then deal with any changes you're going to make after you've negotiated your settlement. Right. That point is incredibly important. So hardly anybody, how many of you have a partial loss? Partial loss. House still standing. How many total? Total loss. Go on. Okay. Almost nobody who has a total loss puts back the exact same house that they had. At almost nobody. You know, but the but the reality is that that is what the insurance company owes, generally speaking, right? So a lot of claims go off track because you're not thinking about about how much it would cost to put that old house back because you don't intend to put that house back, and that can cause a lot of negotiations to go off track. It's also because builders are typically busy and they're not going to they're not going to give you the kind of detail for the house that you had if they know you're not hiring them to build that house. But a very many people end up hiring somebody to do that because they don't because that is a good way of getting an agreement with an insurance company is to get a scope of loss um, prepared of the old as was. Okay? Um, Filing a complaint with the Department of Insurance boosts your leverage. Um, make sure that a summary letter is at the top of your file, meaning so that when the complaint handler opens it, there's a summary right at the top of what has gone down. Okay, next. Um, what are the types of professional help you can hire? A licensed attorney, a licensed public adjuster, a licensed contractor, a licensed or unlicensed construction estimator or a scope preparer. They charge generally between 4000 uh, and a percentage of your project. Um, the question is going to be, can they defend or negotiate on your behalf? Okay. Um, how many of you are having smoke uh, damage issues? Um, okay. All right. Um, that's super common, and I know uh, that could be a topic for a whole other uh, forum, but we have a whole section, again, of our library on partial loss and smoke damage and samples of, of indoor air quality reports and suggestions for how um, to make sure that you have put together your best arguments for getting your house um, restored to a safe and clean condition. Um, what's What are the potential upsides of hiring professional help at this stage? Age. 
um, helping you document your damages, translating unfamiliar lingo and processes, although I think by this stage, probably most of you are pretty savvy about the terminology of insurance. Enforcing your legal rights, that's probably one of the most powerful upsides of hiring professional help. Um, increasing your recovery, finding coverage that you may not know about, um, making sure that you're maxing out in all your categories. Um, what are the potential downsides? The fees reducing uh, your overall recovery, or for example, if you hire um, an adjuster and they want to charge a fee, a, a public adjuster, and they want to charge a fee on money you already got, then that, that is something that can be a problem. You can negotiate that. Um, that the potential downside is it adds to the acrimony with your insurer. The insurer is like, oh my God, this is this person has a lawyer. I'm not going to talk to them anymore. You're going into the legal unit, and then it gets uh, uh, there can be delays. Um, it can also, if you hire a professional who's got too many clients, um, then they can end up being part of the problem, um, and that can reduce your leverage. So, for example, if you've hired um, a public adjuster or a lawyer who's got too much work and they're not paying attention and they're letting uh, communications from the insurance company come in and they're not answering them, that is not helpful. Um, okay, what's the next? Um, we're not going to go into much on this yet, mediation, uh, but that is a great option um, if, you're, if, you're, uh, if you have a very clear sense of how much you need, how much money you need in insurance benefits to get yourself back where you were, right, what your losses were. Um, a mediation can be an inexpensive, informal uh, proceeding, and if you don't like the result, you can walk away. Um, it can be an efficient way of putting the dispute behind you, um, but again, it's because it's voluntary, um, although if you, you know, it, 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 that means the insurance company doesn't have to do anything. No one's telling them what to do. There's no judge saying to them, well, you must do X, right? Mediation is, is, a, is a conciliatory um, negotiation. Um, What's, what are the downsides? You know, um, it can just be a waste of time. I'm going to move on from this slide. Uh, <laughs> but, um, and it can educate the insurance company about, you know, your case, and, and you may not get much information out of them. Appraisal is a term of art in insurance that is a process. It's different from a real estate appraisal. It is a way of resolving a dispute over the value of a loss. So that scenario we've been talking about where your builder says the, the, the fix is going to cost a million and the insurance company is saying it's going to cost 700,000, you can, if you really, if you just, all everything has, you've tried negotiation, you tried filing a complaint with the Department of Insurance and they're digging in their heels, you can say, okay, we want to go to appraisal. You're going to need professional help to get you through it, but it can work. This is a document that shows you how the process works. You hire an appraiser, they hire an appraiser. Those two get together and hire an umpire. Um, next. Um, and then, of course, litigation. Um, you can join a multi-plaintiff uh, suit, a class action suit. Um, you can challenge, like I said, the systematic underinsurance. This is something that I and my organization have been working very hard to fix. Why so many people find themselves so severely underinsured after disasters. Um, there have been, like I said, there are lawsuits already pending. Um, I, I don't want to throw lawyer names out um, from the mic, but you'll find them on our website. Um, systemic fraud, um, improper depreciation, um, disparate, you know, you're treating this this person differently than me. Um, and then, of course, utility negligence and liability. Um, and then individual litigation, you could sue an agent or a broker for what's called errors and emissions. They have insurance for that. Um, or uh, and then th you can file suit as an individual suing your insurance company for breach of contract or and or the um, for them breaching what's called the covenant of good faith and fair dealing which is basically again they behaved unreasonably um, okay um, this there's lots and lots of stuff on our website you've already heard about that um, uh, we got some questions before about um, keeping your insurance uh, after the disaster or um, so uh, I, just a couple points on that. So we have um, guidance on our website about staying protected, meaning 
people say to me, well, there's no house there anymore. Why am I continuing to pay the full full um, premium, right? Um, there is a law that requires your insurer to work with you to adjust the coverage, um, but uh, many people find that it's better just to leave it in as is. Um, the market is a little funky these days. It, a lot of insurance companies have the jitters about wildfires in California. So my recommendation is if you have insurance, you want to hold on to it for now, um, but you, you and don't worry, uh, it's certainly if you you, if you had a loss um, from the Thomas fire, you are protected. You get one renewal of your home insurance guaranteed, um, and it may the law may change to give you two. Um, but you don't need to worry about that um, right now. You have enough other things to worry about because a the law gives you that guaranteed one renewal, and b um, you have options. There's the fair plan, um, what are called non-admitted and surplus lines, etc. Um, on our website. We are uh, partnering with a, um, a something called Yapacopia to do a version of something we call Match Up, where if you've gotten dropped um, and you're having trouble finding home insurance, you can try this service. It's free to get a quote um, to replace the insurance. Um, this is the toll-free number for the DOI, 1-800-927-4357. Um, and again, I really want to thank Lisa and Ben and the school um, for hosting us, and we're looking forward to answering questions. Um, and um, again, please go to our website, uh, uphelp.org backslash survey. That's all you need. We have one survey going right now, and it's your survey. So again, this is your information so that we take your temperature, know what kind of help you guys need that we can provide, um, and then uh, the results are available for you, not with people's names, um, but you can see the data. And please help us um, to do this. So thank you again for your time and your attention. So we, we have our mic up here. I'm going I'm to run around and, and, and run it to people so you don't have to come up and, and speak. I, I want to recognize a couple people. First, John Fry from our Flood Control Division at the county. John, thank you for being here. One of our community heroes out there doing, doing that work to try and get help, uh, help us through the rebuilding. I also want to mention... Um, Amy mentioned the importance of, uh, of past designs uh, of, your, of your property and your home. Um, uh, I wanted to ask Adele Goja. Adele, would you mind standing? Um, Adele is one of the architects. Adele's an architect who works, uh, has been devoted to the Montecito Center um, to help people through the rebuilding process because, you know, not everyone has built a home um, and it's a daunting task to start. And so the American Institute of Architects has, has people devoted to the Montecito Center to help people just think through generally uh, how to, how to be begin approaching the rebuild. But the AIA, our local chapter in the county, they have an archive of your of of many of the floor plans and and designs for people's homes. So if you don't have that, there's a very good chance that that the floor plan for your home is actually archived somewhere. And Adele can help help connect you with those. So um, with that, I um, have a question here. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, my house is on Riven Rock, and it was affected by the mud flow and mud debris that came from my neighbor up on top. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm told that uh, I'm not compensated if I do mitigation to prevent it from happening next spring, for instance, or next uh, rain, rainy season. So that would be on me. The other thing, too, is I want to find out if we are recommended to have flood insurance henceforth or not because i don't have flood insurance right um okay so uh <clears throat> on the question of what is your responsibility um to uh, to do something to your house, to either elevate it or fortify it or something, um, that's going to depend on your local ca your codes, your building codes. And then if you are looking, for example, to apply to FEMA for a mitigation grant, let's say, to fortify, elevate, or otherwise alter your home, they do have a mitigation grant 
program. It does take a while to apply, and I'm guessing that the center probably has some information about um, about options that may be available to homeowners um, to get either low low in, low interest loans or to get a grant. On the question of flood insurance, I want to answer that separately. But Ben, do you have anything on that on oh, mitigation okay. support? Not off the top of my head, okay. but we can we can look into that. They sort of looked at that as an upgrade, as a capital improvement to your property. So it's not, it's not a direct physical loss. So yeah, they usually don't do. But um, but things like let's say if the county required you to put sprinklers in now, then if you had code upgrade coverage. You could argue with your insurance company that they have to pay for the sprinklers because that that is part of what you're going to have to do to get a certificate of habitability in the house. I mean, on flood insurance, that is uh, so. The easy answer is if you can find it and afford it, you should buy it. Okay, um, we were very very concerned for your community um, that that there was going to be an even harder time with getting the home insurers to to pay for the debris flow um, and there was a lot of a lot of political maneuvering that was going on so um, just to be on the safe side for the future um, and I know there was we got a question before tonight um, that there's some preliminary maps being drawn and that um, you may be required to buy it we work in a lot of communities that uh, where X zones and V zones and coastal communities um, where people uh, are being required to buy it right by the terms of your loan um, uh, if you have a mortgage, the bank is requiring you to, and there may be homes in this area that may end up in that category. But again, these are things you you really shouldn't be worrying about now. Um, you know, in terms of like, just try to focus on getting this problem solved, right? Getting figuring out how to get your house back into a livable condition, um, and then worry about okay, should I can I afford flood insurance because it, there, first of all, there's a 30-day waiting period for it. Um, but you should definitely inquire because um, there is a national flood insurance program. There, um, they generally speaking, they have to sell you a policy. That doesn't mean it has to be affordable. Um, but there's also a, a, a very fast developing private market for flood insurance. Um, so you just have to make some calls and, and see what kind of quotes you get. Um, Dennis, did you want to say anything about um, remedies if, if a neighbor's um, uh, slope is responsible for some of your damage? Or is that too dicey? You know? If something escapes from one property because of a failure to keep up that property and it damages a neighbor, then the party from that owns the property from which the mud escaped or something can possibly be liable under that circumstance. But I didn't understand that to be the question. Uh, but uh, it can lead to liability. In fact, that's uh, property loss started as a result of water escaping from one person's property onto another, that was the first case uh, in property law. I'm on my way, Leon. If, if, if everyone could speak directly into the mic, very close to the mouth, that would be great. I have two questions. Uh, the first one is loss of use. Our house is completely gone. It had a tenant, and I can't tell what the policy uh, we are due from the policy okay so typically um, it's a logical um, analysis of of but for you've now lost the use of that property right so what is that costing you right um, so if you were getting rent before yes. Yes. then your loss of use is that lost rent and how long are they uh, so that, obligated to pay that because it may be several years right. uh, before we're able to rebuild if you don't have a time limit and I've seen policies without a time limit um, then most of them are two years um, they're, that's what they're telling us it's yeah. two years but I can't find it anywhere in the policy 
Okay. Well, if it's not in the policy, they can't enforce it. So that's so have you uh, you can write to them and say, please show us the clause in the policy that says Great. that we only have two years. All right. Second question is soft costs. We're finding that to uh, replace uh, the building because there are no plans, and, there, and the building was built in 1957. So and there's nothing on record. So what we're finding is that soft costs are very high. The engineers requiring, they might be tw as much as 25% of what we anticipate the, the uh, hard costs are. So are we, uh, can we expect to be, re the, to, uh, be repaid for all of those? Mm -hmm. Yeah, reasonable costs um, to build your, your place back are covered. So up to your limits, up to your policy limits. So it's still subject. But if you need an engineer or an architect to redraw the, the plans for the property, if you, yeah, that, that's all part of the cost to rebuild. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Neil, am I? I think it's Neil. I promise to come here next. Uh, hi, and first of all, th uh, thank you so much to Ben, Romo, and uh, Adele Gojia. You know, I came here from Sacramento, and we completely lost the uh, uh, rental property, which was an uh, investment property. So, um, Farmers is our agent, and my where I'm confused is, they say, like, if the rebuilding doesn't start in July, they'll stop paying the monthly rental, whatever they are paying which doesn't make sense because the process itself like what FEMA has come out and nobody knows like you know access so I don't know from where they are coming out with these kind of rules and how do we how do we answer them like how do we um, address that second question is while talking you mentioned like talk to similar people who have same kind of insurance apples to apples and see what they have how do i find that information because it's so personalized you know right right well first of all we're hoping that we'll get good results um from this survey um and i think that the center may be able to help um with uh certainly our organization if we find um a large enough group we can we just did this actually this morning for a group up in sonoma we can write to everybody who answers the survey who's insured with farmers and say do you is it okay if we share your your email uh, address with other people who are similarly situated. Um, it's you know if we were closer, we be have we would be doing these meetings more often, and we would have we could put up posters, and at the end of the meeting, you could say anybody who's insured with farmers come over here. You can do that today. If there's other people here who are insured with farmers, um, you know if you don't if you know chat with her at the end of the meeting. Um, there, you know again, I mean you could get limited value from the farmers groups that are organizing up north. Um, but we, we are happy to try to facilitate it. Um, but your first question is, the, the insurance company cannot invent rules that are not in the policy. They cannot, um, that's why we always say like, you know, in writing, show me where the policy says that, uh, that my, my loss of use gets cut off you know, in in uh, 18 months or whatever, something that sounds arbitrary to you. And if they can't show you, then it, then then they can't enforce it. And again, California law is they have to give you um, two full years of additional living expense coverage. No, the the law is two. Although if you didn't, if, so but the house is a total, right? Yeah, it should be two. That shouldn't, I don't think that should, mm, oh, that's a good question. Oh, sorry. Yeah, there's some contracts that say 12 months from the date of loss, um, and I'm not sure, we'd have to go and look and see if the, the, if the 24, yeah, the 24 months was passed, I think it's in response to a disaster, so I don't think it necessarily limits to residential, but we can look that up for you. Um, yes, or I can give you my email. Come and get me. I'll get you my email and I'll look at it for you. But um, they, they, and, and like just saying July, I mean, I'm assuming that you're not even cleared to build on your lot yet. Even if you had everything ready and in place, a lot of these places, you know, you, ca you can't even get in and the infrastructure is not there yet. The county's not ready, you know, all sorts of things. So they can't just arbitrarily say that it's cut off in July. They have to, 
um, give you the reasonable time it takes to repair or replace the property. So, and there's a lot of reasons that you could um, give them that it is not a reasonable amount of time. And I would tell them right away you're going to the Department of Insurance if they don't uh, give you a reasonable amount of time. All right, uh, the mic is back here. Sorry. Hello. Oh, yeah. Um, I, a couple of questions, but uh, uh, just a comment. I, it, it's great to ask your adjuster questions, and you should do it by email. Yeah. But I always copy, for example, State Farm. They have a master email, so I write to the adjuster, and then I copy that. That creates your paper trail. Yeah. You want to be able to ask the question, get the answer. But make them simple. You know, and I've got a couple of simple questions, but I've mm -hmm. sent them to my adjuster because I just want those answers back, and then I can decide what to do with them. So that's just as a general Is comment. that working for you, getting results? Well, the answer is yes, I get response, but it works for me because I've read my policy. I'm also an attorney, so I have in-house counsel, so to speak. <laughs> <coughs> and my wife doesn't seem to appreciate it as much as I think she should, but all right, that having been said, the, a couple of questions. In one of your charts, you had up there the option to buy or sell right. and you had a box checked negotiation and yet I thought I heard you say there's a law that applies to that and so I, I have a couple of sub questions but right. let's just deal with that right. I understand that you have a right to buy and if there's a law you, maybe you could give us that site and then yeah that's insurance code 2051.5 clear as a bell that you may use your replacement value benefits, your dwelling insurance coverage, instead of rebuilding, you can replace your home by buying, okay? The law is clear. Where it's not clear is, at least from the insurance, some of the insurance industry's perspective, I think it's pretty clear, but some people on the other side don't think it's clear. Do you get, if you have an extended, let's say you have a, a, a 25 or a 50% or 100% extended replacement coverage that doubles your coverage or increases your coverage, there have been some adjusters that have said, no, you cannot export that to the, to the purchase. I think they're going to lose that. That one, I, I think that's a loser. So, There's also been an argument about whether they can make a deduction for the land. That one, again, I don't think that the insurer has the authority to, to do that because it's A, there's no, there's no deduction in the policy. There's nothing in your policy that says you can replace by, by buying, but we're gonna deduct land value. So my feeling has been pretty strong that if the policy doesn't give them that right and the law doesn't give them that right, then you have the right to take all your benefits that would have been available to you if you rebuilt your code upgrade coverage if you have it, your inflation adjustment uh, amount, your extended replacement coverage, and and export uh, your other structures coverage if you have that, and trees, everything, everything but but contents uh, that everything that applies to the dwelling, and then put that in a bundle, and and that's what you have available to you to purchase. Now uh, again, because the law is relatively new, um, and because um, some insurers are are saying, well. Well, I don't know about you know this being able to export all your benefits. Um, it it may require some negotiation, all but right. you you have that absolute right in the law. All right. So I, yeah, I think you answered the three sub questions, which would be you have coverage A, which is your basic coverage, right. and then you have your increase. It's a twenty percent in some policy. State Farm is one I'm familiar with. That's mine. And then you have the code upgrade. So if you package those three together, you get. A substantial amount of money but now we'll set that aside because in the rebuild process that involves valuations it involves this room by room evaluation and yet in the state farm policy I know they use the term ACV which is the actual cash value which is used with reference to the real property well it, it, you shook your head no. No, 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 no. I, I, oh. they, they typically will pay the ACV okay, but, until um, you've spent that and then they pay the rest but, but of they, the But that's typically done in, at least the way I was reading, in the personal property category when they want to hold back and say, we'll give you replacement. Right. But you ha we'll pay you the 
value, and they don't use, you know, in the State Farm, they don't use the ACV term, they use the, the, the market value. Right. So I'm gonna set that aside for me because I just wanna focus on the ACV under real property, which is then what a buyer would pay for that property. Now the cases you have on your website, because I took a look while you were talking, talk in terms of if your ACV is less or, or the replacement is more, that you get the higher of the two. I, I, I'm going to give you an example. You might okay, I think, I think just so people don't get confused, I think what the gentleman is talking about is if you decide that you want to use your replacement value insurance benefits to buy a replacement home, you're, he's wondering, or I don't know if you're wondering or you're sharing a strategy. Um, again, whether it would be based on what kind of valuation will the insurance company use to determine how much money you have available to you to buy, right? That's what we're talking about. So what our recommendation is, and this is based on many years of working with the department, with attorneys, that you focus on what would it cost to, if I were going to rebuild that house, okay, what would it cost? So this is a fictional, hypothetical project, right? That should be the amount of money, but you're gonna have to work that documentation up in order to get that negotiated. So I, I just have two short questions, but I'm posing that question to the adjuster exactly that, because I'd like to know that. The, the law might say it, but I want them to agree with this is your three buckets. That right. We have um, an opinion letter on the website from the Department of Insurance's counsel right. interpreting this code section that we're right. talking about. The next category had to do with this Xactimate program. In other words, that's been developed. And I'll just say, as a practical matter, it generates a cost per square foot that is uh, shocking to a, someone who has to rebuild here. $325 a square foot right. versus the typical bids from contractors which are 650 to 7. So question one, how long has this program been in effect that they've used it? Five years, 10 years, 20 years? You know, years? The, th the thing about Xactimate is it it's actually works pretty well for what they use it for every day. So say you have a kitchen fire, you leave the grease on and you burn some cabinets and some paint and a little bit of flooring. They can come in there and they can, they can plug that in. They can make some adjustments for your nice cabinets and go about their business and do a fairly decent job settling the claim. It doesn't, it's not very good for total losses. And the other thing is, is that it's, the company's in Colorado, they do price surveys that I still, I, I was there when Xactimate rolled out. We were one of the first companies to, to, State Farm was one of the first companies to use Xactimate. So I was there when the thing, I still can't really tell you What's how they the come up with the, the um, 90s, early 90s that's maybe. Fine. Yeah. That's a, but I, no, they do price survey updates, but it's they're not used to they're used to Kansas and Bloomington, Illinois. They're not used to Montecito. They they they're not. And so we have this we have the same problem in San Francisco. And and, you, and that's coupled with adjusters that you get that come from out of state who live in houses that cost as much as cars here. You know, so it it they don't really have that basis. So you have to take real prices and insert them into their estimates because their pricing's bad. All right, thank you. Right, and again, just Xactimate is a tool that the insurance industry developed and uses. That doesn't mean it's the be-all, end-all. In fact, like I was saying earlier, an estimate and a scope from a living, breathing builder that's based on subcontractor bids and local pricing is going to trump an Xactimate estimate if you take it to the mat, okay? So just because it looks fancy and just because it's this fat and just because it has a million numbers in it doesn't mean it's right, okay? Could you, I'm next, right next okay. to him, right here. Grab the mic, I won't drop it. Um, could you tell me I uh, filed a complaint with the commission's office and I was told that they, they would take 40 days to respond to it, that, all, uh, that my insurer had 40 days, <coughs> excuse me, and then uh, the state commissioner had another 40 days so I'd be parked for around 80 days or, or more. So if you have a time limit on your, um, you know, living, 
Mm -hmm. Can you address that and tell me? Right. Well, how I that think works. again, as we might said earlier, and I'm not sure if you were here, um, the D the DOI cannot be your lawyer. Um, and I think um, you know we do encourage people to file complaints with them because it's very important that they know what's going on in the market. But it's also important that you not sit around waiting for them to solve your problem to be really candid with you because they they really don't have first of all they don't adjudicate meaning they're not going to say they're right and you're wrong very often um, you know if it's something really obvious where you know you say um, you know the insurance company is wrong about the square footage or the insurance company's got the wrong address or something like that fine um, but again go on record with them um, and certainly try to uh, I mean, I, I still think file the complaint because it, in, it gives you some leverage. I mean, a lot of the time, you know, insurance companies, they do get audited. Um, there are these things called market conduct exams. And, you know, after the Northridge earthquake, there was a big deal where the insurance department did audit a lot of the insurance companies and tallied up a lot of violations and levied a lot of fines. But again, um, I think in your situation, you know, you're building that, that paper trail. And if you feel that you need an advocate we recommend that you hire a, uh, an attorney who I think specializes I, I think I've hired every attorney every in San attorney. River County, but well, um, okay. aside from that. Okay. No, but I, I don't think that quite answers it because okay. I think that what I'm trying to tell the room is that you do go on, on your your claim will not be uh, dealt with anymore by your insurer until that claim oh. becomes... Oh, no, that is no, no, no. That well, should that, not happen. That is what's happening. Well, that <laughs> that is... Did you... I don't know if you saw that slide where we said that in California... California, the home of many, many, many rights for consumers, your insurance company has a legal duty to treat you fairly even after you've sued them. So having you file a complaint with the Department of Insurance should have zero impact on how they're handling your claim. If anything, they should be handling it more, better. Okay. Right? Um, okay, so I have a very quick two-part question um, regarding the uh, certified copy of the policy. Uh, is that something that you should request through your adjuster? No. <laughs> okay. Well, you, do said, well you can try. I mean, I always gave them to people. It's the, You should be able to request it from your adjuster. The problem is on a lot of these disasters, they hire independent adjusters who actually aren't employees of the company. So if, like, say you're with Farmers or State Farm or whatever, and you're actually working with a state farm or farmer's employee, you should be able to ask them and they should do it. But if you're working with like an adjuster from an independent, you guys know the difference? They, a lot of them hire companies to come out and just do do the claims for them and then they, re they report back to the company. So in that case, you should ask your broker or agent. Oh, so that's a good starting point because I really don't even know if my adjuster, they've never identified if they work for my company and or you know what? <laughs> if they're what? Everybody should kind of know that because it's going to sort kind of relate to how well they know your policy because obviously if you have an adjuster that works directly with that company and only that company, they're going to have a better idea of how the policy works than somebody who works for 12 insurance companies and has to read it every time. Okay. So. And then on the establishing the paper trail um, is it I know that we're all used to doing things by email and I suppose by printing out the email no, you have a hard fine. copy email, but, email's fine. but when you're not getting any response from your company um, and uh, do you recommend doing it by um, s snail mail certified mail return receipt requested to prove they got it if you're if you have an important document an important letter that you're sending so they can't say it was lost in cyberspace absolutely and, absolutely okay, yeah especially so. if they're not responding some of some um programs outlook i think can you can get a red receipt um you can go into your settings and you can you can check a box that gets you a receipt that they've read it um yeah that if they're not responding to you yes i would go certified I have a question having to do with uh, smoke damage. So my adjuster said uh, basically there was no such thing as smoke damage unless it was in your home. And I looked at the guy in great shock because I have, uh, I know for a fact that uh, smoke damage is something that they will pay for and have paid for uh, for the previous fire. Right. 
So smoke damage is a little bit like water damage, um, well, uh, and a lot of other things that um, a lot of insurers have, have been um, trying to develop strategies to minimize the payouts or to, um, there's been, uh, let, me, let me put it simply, um, always, you know, you want to focus on getting a reasonably professional, accurate evaluation of the condition of your home so that it's not your word, you, the person who lives there, against an adjuster. But it is very, very common that these days more and more insurance companies are very, um, uh, I don't know, paranoid about people overclaiming health concerns and yet after wildfires it's a real it's a real issue it's a real issue wherever we go that there's been a wildfire that's why in our partial damage library we have we have all kinds of checklists on what are the elements of a home that you have to have inspected if they've been exposed to extreme heat smoke ash particulates right there are pollutants that you can't see right there are particulates that can be in your carpet and your soft goods there are some things um, that shouldn't just cannot be cleaned some things that can and again some adjusters try to do the right thing and some adjusters try to cut corners and say oh no you'll be fine you know just here's a bottle of bleach or whatever, right? So the way to counteract that, if you feel that the insurance company is being way too casual with your health or they are not um, taking seriously the, the damage that's been done to your house, you've got to prove that damage um, in, it, with something independent and they're not going to take your word for it. I'm going to take one, I have a question here from John, but I'm going to take another one, one that we got from a resident who emailed the question in. Um, this, uh, this resident said that their insurance company, we've had multiple evacuations um, tied to the Thomas fire and their insurance company is requiring them to, or, or is applying their deductible to each evacuation in terms of the living ex the, the expenses tied to that evacuation as opposed to so each time they have a six thousand dollar deductible and they're applying the deductible to each point of evacuation which basically uh, prevents so them. in other words you're saying that people have been evacuated were evacuated during the fire and then the the debris flow um, more than one time right yeah um, again it really does depend on how the policy is worded literally right um, how it defines coverage for evacuation expenses and how it defines an occurrence that you know, I could see there being an argument uh, about two events, the, but again, since we're arguing that they're connected, um, you know, then, then you, of course, you make your argument as forcefully as you can on your own that this was just one event, it was all related, it started from the fire, and there should only be one deductible. But this, again, this is one of those fights that is that, that has ended up in courts many, many times. I was telling Sandy that our organization got involved in the briefing over the World Trade Center, whether it was one or two occurrences, because, again, insurance companies will often try to say, oh, no, it's two, and that way they can assess the deductible twice. But it really does depend on the policy language. Okay. I have two questions, please. The first one is we have USAA, and they've actually been pretty good. They paid the limits on the policy, which unfortunately was not nearly enough. Um, but with the contents, they've paid 75%, but to get the additional 25%, they say I have to submit the inventory within one year. And is that... Can they limit it to one year? Except for building, they give us two years. Um, the the um, the law is two years to collect your replacement values on the contents, right? But I think that they can assert a one year um, for you to submit the inventory. I'm pretty sure they can, but it should be one year um, from from the um, first payment of the benefits did they have you gotten anything on the contents yes it's used, they say the 75 yeah, 75 so it should it could be a year is they saying it's a year from then when they paid no, that they, first I, my understanding it's a year from january 9th what does your policy say i will check okay so 
I mean, I, I don't think it was specific about a timeline for paying the contents. I don't think there was a yeah. timeline. Again, I mean, you know, getting them to extend a deadline for submitting an inventory is something that is generally okay. easily, not easily, but it is doable. You know, you're not asking them to pay more money. You're asking them to give you more time. So usually they'll they'll do that. You know, and again, not to, not to you know, diss the Department of Insurance too much. I'm just being candid about what they can and can't do. Um, they, they can be very helpful in getting deadlines extended. That is something that I've seen them do very well. The second question is we have a 25% replacement cost coverage, um, but they've said that that's only with incurred expenses. So they will not pay that unless I can show them receipts for... You're talking about the, the balance of the, above the 25? No, this is for, I mean the so, so they've paid the limits of the policy for the loss of the structure. But I also had a replacement cost coverage rider, which unfortunately is only 25%. It's not true replacement cost. But they said they won't pay any of that unless I can prove their incurred expenses. And so it's not money. Because it sounded like you were talking before that you could take all of these things, replacement cost coverage, all of these things, and use them to buy another property. Our insurance company said clearly not. The replacement cost coverage is an incurred expense only. Well, this is what I'm saying, that, the, that the, the Department of Insurance has issued an opinion letter, the counsel for the department, and it's published on our website. And in their opinion, which has some legal weight, definitely, um, you, you export your, your uh, extended replacement benefits to what you have to, to buy. You should be able okay. to. I'll get back to you. Bear with me here. I I want to keep my promises in terms of who's next. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how you want to if you want to keep to the time I'm of fine, the. I'm fine. Okay. Here as long as okay. Else is. Sure. Okay. Hi. Um, so we have a partial loss, and just sort of along the lines of the your question. Oh. Along the we have a partial loss. And along the lines of the earlier question about the sort of repeated evacuations, mm -hmm. I, I shudder to ask this question, but so we're in the process of applying for permits to rebuild and we're just wondering, okay, well, what if we're in the middle of rebuilding and this happens again? What is that? What happens then? Well, that's uh, you're going to keep your insurance. Right, but right? I mean, would that then be a new claim? Pro yes. And does that mean that the what like what we're in the middle of right now just stops or yeah well you know uh, no, there's a universe of yeah. possibilities yeah. it doesn't stop it doesn't stop the problem that might happen is that they've made decisions that the the debris flow claims are stemming from the fire earth movement debris flow all those are generally not covered under these homeowners insurance policies so the, and they've decided it's proximate the proximate cause of these it damages is fire. The problem is, is when it's not proximate anymore, that, and and that'll be a legal fight on whether, if there's a subsequent event, say we get here in the spring and, and it starts raining and things come down, a subsequent event, whether or not that's proximate to the fire or not proximate to the fire. It won't cut off the benefits that you're entitled to receive from the first loss. Um, but it will it will complicate things. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and again, um, things like buying flood insurance now, you don't know until you until you make some calls and and find out what kind of quotes you can get and what they'll cover. And again, you know, when if you are shopping for flood insurance, you know, we have tips on our website. Um, but generally, you know, you really want to take good notes when you're talking to the agent or broker or the insurance company. And now you all know, right? Um, he with the note and sh or she with the most notes wins um, when it comes to like if you if you have really good notes that you said okay is this insurance going to cover me if everything is gone or if there's another debris flow and and write down their answers right and if it's not the answer you want call somebody else okay yes you mentioned that there were several bills that were going to be presented and hopefully passed could you possibly give us a summary of what these might be 
Well, um, there were 14 different bills that were introduced, um, and the one uh, some of them are already dead, but some of them are still alive. Um, the one that um, Senator Hannah Beth Jackson is sponsoring is definitely still alive. That has to do with um, basically confirming that the fire flood sequence um, should still be covered under a home policy. Um, there is one that would give you a third right to get your home insurance renewed after um, if after you had a loss. Uh, there's the one that the one that would have required insurers to give you 80 percent of your contents benefits without an inventory is dead. We lost that one. Um, there is there are a couple of still that are still alive, um, giving you a third year of ALE. Now, whether that could be retroactive, I, I, I mean, I never thought we were going to win on ret retroactivity up in this in this house or in this in this uh, current political climate. Um, but but I never say never. I mean, I, your your elected officials have been fighting very hard up there. It's it's impressive. Um, so that's most of it. Um, but I don't really recommend banking on any of it. You know, really, um, by the time things get through the 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 sausage factory, um, it's really they're generally going to be pretty um, watered down. I mean, it's it's you know maybe next year we can come back um, when folks are a little bit more on their feet. It was pretty tough to try to round up people in your situation to go up there this year. It was everybody's still very raw, um, so there was a lot of kind of you know the insurance industry just locked arms up there and you know they live there every day. Um, there, you know, it, I was up there for the Senate and the Assembly Insurance Committee meetings, and the, almost the entire, you know, all the chairs are filled with insurance company lobbyists. So, so that's not to discourage you. I still think you're going to get some leverage. You are getting leverage um, from what's going on up there and the media attention. But you have to keep on um, put, keeping the, the your voices heard in the media about what's going on. So I. <laughs> So uh, this is for our senator, you guys, as um, uh, the you know the United uh, policy. policy, and for Mr. Fry, also, um, and if there's any representative from planning or architectural, so for I mean everything is compartmentalized. So there are three things that I'm looking at, like someone whose house got totally destroyed. One is um, uh, money that was allocated on based on assumptions by the f insurance company. Now, talking with after the FEMA maps were released, looking at the uh, the elevations, understanding the pink lines, understanding like for, for like for example, for my property, I talked and then I learned that there has to be the special. What's that? Um, steel ingraded piers that need to go 40 feet down and 10 feet above and only then a structure can be built. It cannot be perpendicular to the uh, stream which runs behind the house. It has to be parallel to the stream. So and I'm sorry, are you asking a question um, about the per local permit requirements? Yeah, yeah, yeah requirements? it's a question for everyone because things are compartmentalized but for the person who lost the house, mm -hmm. Dealing with different situations is very hard. Yes. So, so, so what I'm trying to say is, one is insurance, which assumes and gives you certain X amount of money, right. which is not enough clearly for this kind of construction that is going to be needed. Then the house facing parallel, which will be facing another house. If you read the 53 pages of the Montecito Architectural Board, you know, there are very stringent guidelines, very inflexible guidelines for privacy and this and that. It's very, uh, so, so, so what I'm trying to say is, there's issue of time frame conflicts, there's discrepancy in the money allocation, that we pay the price, the one, ones who have suffered, you know, 
and then there is the issue of the various requirements that FEMA has come up with versus what Montecito Architectural Board because I did read those 53 pages you know okay I would say because I want to try to um, wrap up here let people um, go and and enjoy the rest of their evenings but it seems to me that you have an incredible resource here in the Montecito Center um, that pulled this together tonight um, that that's exactly what they're here for is to is to um, bring coordinated resources to the community um, and they're here and they have a table back there um, so I would just suggest that you take advantage of that resource um, because it, it, it I think exact that's exactly their role is to try to um, help you one-stop shop with the county and and the local building requirements and insurance and architectural rules sure hi um, actually my question is kind of similar to what she was asking uh, I'm wondering if there is uh, something that's come about uh, for compensation that's specific to what happened with this disaster I have to raise my house seven feet and you know I have to there's all these other things that I have to do now. You know, I have to unplug the sewer line underneath the street and do all these things. But it's not covered by insurance. Is there any... Well, when you say it's not covered, I mean, when, it's, it, when you say it's not covered, if it is, if these are things that you have to pay for in order to get a certificate of habitability when you rebuild, then you can make an argument that they are covered as code upgrades or, or building and ordinance compliance if you have that coverage and if it's enough. My guess is it's probably not, w not even close. Raising Right, house. right. And this is where you can, this is where, you know, you can think about joining one of the suits against the utility, you can think about an SBA loan, and you can think about a FEMA mitigation grant. But again, um, the, the, if, if you certainly should try to establish which of those, of those upgrades are being required by local codes and ordinances and make sure that you use your benefits toward that. Just like a now where is my magic wand? Hi, I have a question regarding flood insurance, yeah. both FEMA and on private policies. Right. Um, the mud flow was not considered a flood, right? So in my case, I had $2,000, I think, of volcano, landslide, and mud coverage, so it's lucky they linked it to the fire. My question is, how does FEMA consider a mud or a debris flow? Is that covered under FEMA? Well, and, uh, when you say FEMA, um, there's the National Flood Insurance Program, and then there's the FEMA that you know of that pays for fixing bridges and No, I'm highways. sorry, the National Flood the na okay. Insurance. The National Flood Insurance Program policy, the standard flood policy, is often described as it covers chocolate shake, not chocolate cake, right? So the debris flow. So you guys are in a funky territory, and um, there you, you did get lucky with having that pocket of coverage. Um, I would say, and there are things called difference in conditions policies, um, this is where you want to work with an agent who's really good, um, who you you know you're going to have to do some some ferreting out to find one, um, and and lay that scenario out. And it may not be somebody in this area, but you know maybe somebody you find online. For example, um, in Colorado, where we did a lot of work um, after wildfire, and then there was flooding, um, and so we had occasion to to ferret out a couple of age of, of brokers that that's what they do is sell flood insurance and 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 there is a gray area for sure you you're right you know okay so if you pay for shake but not cake who pays for cake right um, and in general no one pays for landslides unless you have some proximate event that causes them so if you have you know if you even if you have flood insurance if there is a landslide just an earth subsidence claim just because even if it you know rains hard and that there's no coverage for that there and you can't buy it 
So it's not something that is insurable, generally. So, so the thing threatening us in terms of safety, life safety, the most, yes. is not insurable, unless it, it can be the proximate much. cause. Fine, but yeah. I have to say the market is the market is changing. The market is dynamic. There are all these private equity guys that say and reinsurance companies that are chomping at the bit to get into the flood insurance business, or they say they are. So again, I can't stand here and say I know every policy that's out there on the market today, but I don't want to promise you that there is something. But Sandy is right. Under the existing forms that we know of, that is. Uh, it, it, your landslide is an uninsured again unless there you find a trigger you know you can find a, a you know if there if there's something that happened a pipe that broke a tree that fell a something that snapped something then you know you can argue for coverage at what point does the proximate cause expire <laughs> Or is well, that the $50 million question? Well, that, I mean, I think, you know, this one, again, there was, there is something in known in hydrology and geology called the fire flood sequence, right? That it is, everybody understands, you know, when hillsides are denuded and the water, blah, blah, blah. You don't need to hear me go through that whole thing. Um, whether two, you know, whether three weeks or four weeks is, you know, it, it really, I don't think there's an absolute, um, you know, n number of hours or days. It's going to be, you know, do, can you find a credible expert who's going to say that, that there was a connection between this event and that event physically? I think, I think that would be a very tough, very, very, very tough. I have one last question from uh, from the uh, from a resident who wasn't able to be here, and it's one that we've heard a number of times at the center. So I want to get it out there. Um, this resident has received a payment of two hundred thousand um, dollars, and has spent already one hundred fifty thousand dollars out of pocket in advance of getting that payment from their insurance company, but their their lender their mortgagee is holding the money, uh, is holding that $200,000 because this resident still owes 700,000 on their property. Um, so they're putting the money out, and but they're not getting any back that's been issued by the insurance company. Is there any remedy to that? Okay, so your your lender is not allowed to hold on to um, money above what you owe on your mortgage, so that's one thing. Um, but another is they, um, they certainly cannot make you pay down or prematurely your loan obligation, but they do, they are listed as an additional named insured on your policy, which means if, if you have a mortgage, right, which does give them the right to control some of the payout, right? And if, in theory, as soon as you provide them with evidence that you've spent up to, to the amount they were withholding, they're supposed to release some more money. Now, that finding the person at the, the whatever fiscal entity now holds your paper, because mortgages get sold, bounce around, finding a human being who has the authority to release um, your insurance money can be very difficult. Um, that's another one where I think the Department of Insurance can be helpful. Um, but again, you know, we have a publication called Let Go Lender, you know, how to get your, your uh, mortgage company to either pay interest on the monies that they are holding um, and or release insurance funds. Um, we have some suggestions but it is for your protection on some level, um, you know, that that your lender keep an eye on the contractor, make sure that they have completed the work at, that they said they were going to do. Um, so uh, even though I know it's, it's, it, it is frustrating, um, the reality is that there is are a lot of contractors who um, will come along after disasters and, and, and maybe not, you know, deliver all the way. So there is a little bit of a, of a, of a good reason for that they should well they should be they should be making progress payments so they should release um, at the very least they should release a little bit as a deposit and then they should make progress payments just like as you pay your contractor for various stages of the of the work the lender should come out take a look at it verify that work is done and release the progress payments so if they're not doing that that you need to lean on them because they have whole departments to deal with this and they should they should be doing it okay and then I'm sorry, 
one last mm -hmm. very simple question. Are insurance payments taxable income? Um, uh, so, <laughs> um, it, it, maybe I, it's not simple. Yeah, it isn't. And that's why, and we're not, you know, but we do have a publication that talks about it. The simple answer is you should get tax advice, um, from a, from a, a CPA who has casualty loss tax prep experience. That's how we see it. Um, we have a whole, uh, we did a whole one of these workshops. It's videotaped. It's on our website and it's taught by a CPA who, uh, lost his home in the wildfire and he talks all about about strategies for you know amending your last year's return. Um, I don't believe uh, that you're that you're as long as it's not um, compensation above the policy limits, it shouldn't be taxable. I think you have only a couple years though. Yeah, I think the main issue is if you don't if you don't replace your home. Some people have like two homes, right? So, oh, sorry. Um, I, the, the main the main scary area is if you have two homes, okay? So if you have a home and say you have a, a income property or another property, vacation house, you, this one burns, and when you take all the insurance money out of that, sell the lot, and then go live in the other one, that's where you have to be careful because that's essentially the sale of your property, your primary residence, all of that. But in general, insurance policies compensate you for something that you've lost. So like your contents, you had that. It's not, you're not making a gain. It's not a taxable gain. So without giving tax advice, that is generally. That is generally. Okay, well, I think that's about it.